Hello and welcome to today's Global Fleet Champions Spotlight session. Global Fleet Champions Spotlights are short, focused webinars to help anyone who employs people who drive for work to manage road risk within their organisation. Each spotlight provides in-depth insight into a particular topic relevant to your fleet safety programme. For more information, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. Today's spotlight session is focused around driver distraction and is sponsored by Reflex Vehicle Hire. Anything that draws a driver's attention away from the road, even for just a moment, can lead to fatal consequences. Making sure that drivers are not exposed to distractions like using a phone or adjusting a sat-nav is one of the most important things that fleet managers can do to make their workforce safer. In a moment, a multiple choice question poll will appear on your screen so we can find out your views on this topic. It is anonymous, simply select one answer and press submit and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which will take place at the end of today's presentations. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. A big thank you to our sponsor, Reflex Vehicle Hire, and to you all for viewing today's Spotlight session. The poll question will appear on your screen shortly and the webinar will then begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr Neil Kinnear. I'm Head of Behavioural Science at TRL, the Transport Research Laboratory. I've been asked today to talk about driver distraction. I'm very grateful to Break for inviting me to do so and grateful to you for listening. Today I'm going to just cover some areas of defining driver distraction, what we can learn from psychology about dr driver distraction, and what we can learn from laboratory simulators and real world evidence about the impact of uh, distraction on driver performance and crash risk. So let's start with defining driver distraction. Well, why is it of interest to us? It's something that is considered to be a contributory factor in a, a large number of accidents in Europe, the US and around the world. Driver distraction is a great concern, but it's actually very difficult to quantify. Estimates put it around a quarter to a third of a uh, of all accidents involve some form of driver distraction, but that's likely to be a huge underestimate due to the way that collisions are recorded and the difficulty of establishing whether uh, distraction played a role in a crash happening uh, after the event. So it's expected that uh, the driver distraction plays a much bigger role in crash risk than the, the numbers tell us. One of the difficulties is that we haven't, we don't all have the same definition of distraction. Actually, distraction is just one form of driver inattention. It's possible for a driver to pay insufficient attention to the driving task. And that's not necessarily distraction, that's just insufficient attention. And that could be something, for example, related to fatigue, where someone isn't putting in enough attentional effort to perform the task uh, to the standard required and therefore puts themselves and others at risk. Driver distraction is actually a form of misdirected attention when actually the driver is paying attention but moves attention away from the driving task to something that isn't required for safe driving. Those distractions could be internal or external to the vehicle. Types of distractions include visual, auditory, manual and cognitive. Clearly the eyes are critical uh, to the information that we process as we're driving and anything that takes the eyes away from the road or the, the area around us uh, has the ability to distract the driver. That could be due to controlling things inside the vehicle or to advertisements or all of the things that are in the external world that are trying to get our attention. Then there's auditory uh, distraction, which could be things that are actually meant to get our attention, like beeps in the car, that are informing us of something that needs our attention. They could be related to driving or they could be messages that are appearing on a mobile phone, for example. Manual distraction clearly occurs when holding a mobile phone or food, for example. And cognitive distraction is when the mind is engaged in something else and it's thinking about something else or paying attention to something else. When distraction becomes a problem, 
is when the timing of that distraction overlaps with some other unexpected event or some increase in demand on the driver which the distraction means they don't have the ability to cope with. They don't have the spare capacity left to manage both situations. There are many factors about what the task specifically involves that the person is distracted doing. So for example, if having to send a text message whilst driving, that's a, a fairly intensive task that, that would require a lot of uh, looking away from the road, uh, a lot of checking and a lot of input by the driver. It would require manual distraction, visual distraction, uh, and it would be quite a, a cognitively intensive process as well. Resumability refers to how easily a task could be dropped uh, so the driver can concentrate on driving and then picked up again. That may be like uh, an easy one would be uh, setting the radio station in the car. You can, if you didn't fully get it the first time, you can pay attention to the road and then turn back to it and it'll still be in the same place where you left it. Clearly, the more frequently you perform an, a distracting action, uh, like the more often someone is texting in a vehicle or using their phone uh, or eating while driving, the more often they're doing that, the more likely they are for that action to coincide with a critical event. And also the duration matters. Uh, a mobile phone call, for example, could go on for a significant amount of time and distract the driver for that whole period of time, whereas tuning the radio only might only take a few seconds. And then there's what we call the hangover effect, which is a lingering cognitive or emotional distraction that is caused by something like having a mobile phone call. We know from studies that even after the phone call is, has ended, that driver's performance can be impacted because they're still processing what went on in that phone call and what that means to them and what they might need to do next, for example. So what can we learn from cognitive psychology that can help us understand driver distraction? Well, driving is a cognitive task. Ultimately, we have to take in the world around us at great pace and process all of that sensory information and make it meaningful in a fast amount of time for us to then adapt and have a behavioural response, whether that be a change in speed or direction, and manage the roadway in front of us. Cognitive psychology is the study of internal mental processes, like learning, memory, skilled performance, all of these which are relevant to driving. And we know that through traditional uh, psychology experiments that there are limitations to our cognitive processes. That we are not, we can't take on everything, that every, every process we have has a limit to how much it can do at one time. An easy example is short-term memory, which has been found to be able to process the you know, seven plus or minus two chunks of information that we retain for a short period of time. So if I read you a list of 10 items and then in 30 seconds time asked you to tell me them back, you would probably tell me between five and nine of those items. This slide is deliberately difficult for you to, to read. Um, and that's because it's identifying and showing that the brain never focuses on two tasks at the same time. One of our limitations, one of the cognitive limitations we have as humans is that our brain switches between two tasks. The multitasking is in fact a myth and actually different parts of the brain have to compete for attentional capabilities at the same time. Actually, the brain will switch between one to the other. And when it switches back and forth, it performance on both tasks is, uh, is impacted and deteriorates. Now, because driving is such a complex task and requires so many different parts of our, of our cognitive processes, any additional task that we add on to that means that the driver is unable to pay sufficient attention to all activities required for safe driving. And that can lead to a processing failure in the wrong circumstances, putting the driver and other road users in danger. Just to give an example of the mental complexity of driving, if we break it down, tasks required on every journey might be navigation, which would require our short-term memory and planning, maintenance of control of the vehicle, our perceptual and physical skill sets, Interacting safely with other road users. That could be anticipating and understanding uh, other road users' behaviour. Complying with road rules would require a long-term memory and current awareness. 
control stress emotions resulting from the driving environment. That would involve inhibiting emotional and stress response. Maintaining self-image, that would be emotional and social regulation. So it's clear that just for everyday driving, there are a number of cognitive functions that we must undertake. And therefore, adding another secondary task uh, when undertaking driving, the simple driving task, will basically deteriorate performance on any one of these. So let's consider hazard anticipation as an example of this. Hazard anticipation is a skill that has been shown to be critical to safe driving. It's essentially the skill that allows us to predict what might happen next and allows us to therefore stop that happening by basically responding much earlier and that might be by slowing down or changing direction. And it's been shown that experienced drivers are much better at this than novice drivers. So let's consider a historical study, laboratory study by McKenna and Farrand. In this study, uh, drivers essentially responded to filmed um, hazard perception clips that they watched on a TV screen. It was like a hazard perception test. And essentially they had to identify when a hazard was developing. And they had a group of novice drivers and a group of experienced drivers. Both groups did the task on its own first. And then they performed the task whilst a researcher had a conversation with them. So a very simple experiment. So let's think, look at the chart on the right and a, a higher score is a better performance on the hazard perception test, okay? So let's, don't worry about the, the scale, let's just look at the higher score is better, right? So this shows that novice drivers scored around that level. How do you think experienced drivers performed in comparison to the novice drivers on the single task of just doing hazard anticipation? I'm going to guess that you're quite intelligent folk and you would say that experienced drivers would probably do better. And you'd be correct. Experienced drivers were much better than novices at, that, at perceiving hazards on this test. So, how do you think novice drivers performed at this task when they were distracted by having a conversation at the same time? Again, I'm sure you're quite uh, intelligent and you would think that their score would be less. And correct again, you'd be right. Novice drivers were much worse at perceiving hazards when they were distracted by having a conversation. So finally, how do you think experienced drivers performed at the task when they were distracted by having a conversation at the same time? I'm going to assume that you will probably be saying, yeah, they would also do worse than the single task, but still better than the novices. But in actual fact, there was no statistically significant difference between experienced and novice drivers when they were doing the conversation-like task and the hazard perception test. What this shows is that just a simple conversation-like task interferes with that, the ability to anticipate hazards, even for experienced drivers. In fact, what it tells us is that when a driver is distracted, for example, speaking on their mobile phone while driving, is they lose all of that uh, benefit they have of being experienced. But you might say, yes, this is a very simple laboratory study. What does this, you know, uh, it doesn't really apply to the real world. So let, let's look at uh, the next step up, which would be simulator studies. So a recent simulator study conducted by TRL was to test the impact of infotainment systems on driver performance. So infotainment systems uh, like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay uh, are are recent additions uh, to vehicles where people can plug in their mobile phones and it will show on the vehicle display. And it is an interface that allows the driver to play music, navigate to destinations, receive and play text messages that are read out to them and make or receive calls. Android Auto looks somewhat like this with typical apps and features. Uh, and it can be controlled through voice control and touch control. Apple CarPlay looks similarly like this. And what's beneficial about these systems is that they've been demonstrated to be better than official uh, engine manufacturer systems. So the systems that car manufacturers have been bringing out for the sort of previous 10, 15 years have been built upon by Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and were, have actually been shown to be better 
understand these systems uh, in terms of the amount of effort that drivers have to put in to engage with the system. They've also been shown in American studies to be less distracting um, and particularly the voice control features uh, of Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are much better than the systems that vehicle manufacturers originally had in their in their systems in their cars. In this study, we looked to understand what impact Android Auto and Apple CarPlay had on driver performance, and also how they compared to other forms of driver impairment that TRL had tested uh, over the years in our Digi Car. 40 participants took part, and there were essentially two studies, an Android Auto study where 20 participants who used Android phones took part, and 20 participants uh, who commonly use Apple phones uh, took part in the Apple CarPlay study. In both, uh, drivers completed three drives, one a control drive where they simply drove the vehicle, uh, a second in a voice activation drive um, where they controlled features of the system through voice activation only, and the same, a third drive where they controlled uh, the systems through touch control only. Drives were undertaken in the TRL DigiCar, which is an advanced driving simulator, drives just like a real car um, with sort of full surround graphics and a, a sophisticated motion system. Um, and because we can fully customize the environments, we have what is called the TRL impairment route. And that's a route that has been used from studies back in the early 2000s uh, on mobile phones, where we did a, a, a classic study to benchmark the effect of mobile phone use against driving at the legal alcohol limit. And since then, we've tested many other types of distraction um, from social media use to texting uh, to kids in the car and music, etc. Here's an example of a participant being asked to navigate to the nearest petrol station. What you can see from that clip is that it could be any one of your drivers. Um, that was a very simple requirement to, uh, to look across to the system to put in some instructions to find the nearest petrol station. That might be something that many drivers could do. Uh, but you saw that actually it impacted in a loss of control for a momentary loss of control that in the wrong circumstances could have been critical. What we found overall is that, particularly when doing tasks like selecting music on these devices, uh, drivers demonstrated that it impacted on the demand of the task. And as a result, they reduced their speed, um, but actually their speed variance uh, greatly changed. So the average speed actually hides the fact that their control of speed was much more varied. Um, and that's something I think that we all sort of experience uh, if you drive the motorway a lot, that you will see people people's speed go up and down and you wonder what's going on and when you pass them you'll see that they're you know speaking on their mobile phone. Um, similarly their deviation of headway increased significantly um, and their deviation of lane position so their lane wandering uh, uh, increases as well. Essentially their general car control uh, and performance is reduced but particularly so in the touch control uh, scenario. When receiving and making a, receiving text and making a call, we found the same pattern of results, um, but in a slightly more exaggerated way, where uh, this was clearly more taxing, and therefore speed uh, variation and average speed reduced uh, even more, and deviation of lane position was even greater. Um, we also required uh, respondents, uh, participants, when they were taking part, when we sent them a text message and it was read out, it gave them a list of shopping items. Now, if you remember back to what I said about uh, our short-term memory and the seven plus or minus two rule, we gave them uh, a list of shopping items and asked them to recall how many they could uh, they could remember when they, when they phoned us afterwards. And they could actually only recall two, three or four items. Um, now that tells us that their performance 
on the driving task was impacted, but also their short-term memory and performance on remembering the list of items was also impacted. So we can see that both tasks uh, are being impacted by this distraction. In terms of eyes off road, this was a critical measure because we know from previous work that taking your eyes off the road for just two seconds can double the risk of a crash. Clearly, uh, visual uh, senses is, is critical for safe driving. In terms of the, the touch control drive, this table shows Android Auto um, sort of to the left of the, the table and Apple CarPlay to the right of the table. There are two columns for each, uh, the what we recorded in the simulator and then what the self-reported, what people thought their time of looking away from the road was. This is the cumulative time looking away to perform the whole task. People wouldn't spend this whole time away at one time, but they would glance away and we recorded cumulatively how many glances there were, how long that took to complete the task. And what we see is that drivers took a quite significant amount of time for some of these tasks. The guidance in America suggests that uh, a task to complete a task shouldn't take more than 12 seconds. All of those in red took more than 12 seconds to complete, um, with some quite concerning uh, numbers around selecting music um, and the uh, reading a text message and making a call, for example. But also navigation, simple navigation took a significant amount of time in the touch control task as well. What's worrying is that drivers didn't think they spent that long uh, performing the task and the, re the reality is that they did spend much longer looking away from the road than they thought. However, what we find from voice control is that actually that allows people to keep their eyes on the road much more. So voice control could be one of the ways forward for improving the human machine interface with future systems. And we're encouraging that this is something that's looked into more uh, as it allows eyes on the road. We clearly still need to be concerned about distraction, but voice control could be one of the ways of improving distraction where systems are integrated with vehicles. For example, when we look at reaction time differences uh, to the control drive, we actually find that selecting music on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto was the, showed the worst reaction time that we've measured in the simulator compared to previous studies. This increase in reaction time um, is essentially similar to someone being on the phone, a handheld phone, when using touch control. So it's not dissimilar. So the the cognitive load, the, 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 the need, the manual need to take your hand from the steering wheel um, and the eyes off the road all lead to an impairment in reaction time. Drivers were also more likely to miss external events happening when we measured this in the simulator. So not only were they, did they take longer when they did notice it, they were more likely to miss an event happening altogether. So there are still some real concerns about these systems and it would be good for there to, to be a, a testing uh, framework developed so that uh, manufacturers could demonstrate safe use of the systems before they're implemented in vehicles. Okay, so that's laboratory studies, simulator studies, but do we have any evidence from the real world? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, so the 100 car study in the US was a large naturalistic vehicle study where 100 cars, funnily enough, were <laughs> instrumented with a number of sensors and video cameras uh, for 12 months. Um, and all of the mileage captured and then analysed uh, significantly. <laughs> and in 80% of crashes and 65% of near crashes, um, in, they involved driver inattention of some kind before the event. Visual inattention uh, contributed to 93% of rear-end crashes, and in-car mobile devices were associated with the most frequent, the highest frequency of distractions for near crashes. It's also worth noting that younger drivers uh, were more likely to uh, be involved in near crash events that involved uh, use of an in-car mobile device as well. And also there's a historical study uh, that analysed phone records of drivers who'd been involved in crashes. Um, and this is where 
you you might be aware of a, a typical statistic that's often noted where driver that drivers are at least four times more likely to have a crash when speaking on a phone and that comes from this study uh, that analyzed phone records afterwards and and noticed that there was no difference between hands-free and handheld use which is also supported by the simulator work uh, and laboratory work that has been shown uh, previously by trl and others that hands-free is also distracting due to the cognitive distraction and handheld there's not a lot of difference between handheld and hands-free uh, conversation on the distraction on a driver the theoretical arguments are clear cognitive psychology allows us to understand that there are known processing limits distraction happens in the head as well as in the hands it's not all about taking your hands off the wheel the evidence base is compelling from laboratory based tasks to simulator driving and real world driving uh, research. New and vehicle technologies are something that we need to consider how safe they are for drivers to use. And in a fleet scenario, it might be worth considering what features a, a vehicle has and what you will allow your drivers to use of those features. Um, just because it's legal doesn't always mean it is safe. All secondary tasks, ultimately, that require attention will reduce our focus on driving safely. So any systems that are also put into vehicles within fleets are also likely to possibly take the driver's attention away. And so clear guidance on when systems can be used, uh, i.e. when the vehicle is stopped, um, is, is going to be useful. A simple mantra is eyes on the road, hands on the wheel and mind on the traffic. Thank you very much. That concludes the presentation section of today's webinar. A huge thank you to our speaker, Dr. Neil Kinnear from TRL, for doing that presentation for us. I'm pleased to say that Neil has joined us today for a live Q&A session. Uh, but first, we are going to discuss the results of today's poll. As you can see, when asked which of these driver distractions are you currently managing through policies and procedures, 100% of respondents said they have these in place for handheld mobile phone use. But around three quarters, 77%, are managing hands free mobile phone use. 50% are managing eating and drinking at the wheel. 41% are managing using and adjusting in vehicle entertainment systems. And 59% are managing using and adjusting in vehicle navigation systems, such as SatNav. Uh, Neil, what are your thoughts on these results? Uh, I don't think they're surprising as such, and probably what. What we might expect. Um, I think handheld mobile phone use is, is a policy that is quite simple uh, for police and organisations to implement because of the fact that it is an illegal act. Um, whereas hands free mobile phone use does uh, is a grey area where it's uh, where it is allowed and um, and so it is up to the organisation to define their own policy. Uh, so it's you know encouraging to see that uh, a large number have implemented that as a policy. Um, but it's it's interesting that some haven't. Um, eating and drinking is is you know showing a 50-50 split on on whether that's something to you know try and manage or not. Uh, but I guess the you know the interesting one because of the results of the recent study is is the vehicle entertainment systems, which are massively varied and do make it difficult to have common policies that can cover use in all vehicles. Um, and it's you know it, it's difficult to implement a a cover all policy for, for that type of thing um, and the same for, for navigation systems but given that they are now usually integrated with somebody's phone so I, I don't think it's surprising to see that there's a you know a mixed bag and sort of a bit of a 50 50 split on on these items you discussed hands-free mobile phone use in your presentation um what do you su suggest fleet managers can do to reduce hands-free phone use if drivers feel they're pressured to make calls as part of work, for example, if they're between jobs and moving between sites, they feel they've got a call they really need to catch up on. Obviously, there are risks associated with doing that. Um, yeah, what measures should, do you think they should introduce to make it clear this is something that we shouldn't be doing? Yeah, so it's it's, it's a difficult one, but the, uh, the the clear you know clear guidance is, is necessary on this. Um, ultimately, hands-free mobile phone use is just as distracting and distracting as handheld mobile phone use um, and and really the, the clearest policy is that that's not what we do 
uh, and it's not expected that you will make a call when driving at all uh, and that you will be stopped whenever you, you need to do that. And if that's a company policy that is across the organisation so that the people in the office also know they can't communicate with people when they're driving and everyone buys into that, then that's going to be your, your strongest policy. Um, it, it's clear guidance, really. Uh, that, that is the most important thing, yeah. Thank you, and I hope that answers the question that was submitted. Um, we have another one here. How distracting is conversation in the vehicle cab between drivers and passengers? Um, I suppose it's maybe having a, if they're having a conversation, if hands-free phone use is a distract, distraction that's to be avoided, in what way is that different to a conversation between you know, a driver and a passenger in their own vehicle? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, so people often ask this because they think, well, surely speaking hands-free is just the same as having a conversation with a passenger. Reality is it's not, and there's some really subtle differences that you, you see when this is studied. That when you're speaking to a passenger in the vehicle, and actually you can do this next time you're driving and speaking to someone, you will notice that they are also looking ahead most of the time and they adapt their conversational sort of pace to the demands of the driving task and so whilst yes everything will distract you to some extent that in in cab conversation is actually very uh, sort of has minimal distraction because the other person usually manages the conversation along with the, the demands of the driving task at a time so for example if you if the passenger sees that you are currently at a junction and you're looking either way and it's difficult for you to pay attention, they often stop talking until you're, you've pulled out of that junction safely. On a phone, obviously that person can't see you. So on a mobile phone call, that person continues talking and is completely you know, distant from the demands that you have as a driver. And so it's, it's that difference that's really subtle, but it makes, it's the difference between what is, you know, a, a safety critical distraction and, and one that's just sort of uh, manageable within the, the vehicle. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what are your thoughts on incentivizations for drivers to comply with distraction policies? There are some companies out there that may offer um, you know, rewards in terms of um, financial recompense or something like that in for having a strong adherence with distraction policies. Is this something you would recommend or what are your thoughts on it? In, in the right circumstances, incentives uh, can work um, and they can encourage the, the right behaviours, but ultimately it, it will require the sort of a, a safety, you know, uh, culture and the policies to be clearly agreed with and supported and that the incentive isn't the only thing that, that is supporting that. If it is, it's, it's not likely to, to last. You make it an initial effect, but then it will wear off. Um, so, you know, I, if everyone is bought into a policy uh, from management down, it's that development of everyone agreeing and, and buying into it. That seems to be, you know, the importance of a, a longer lasting policy that, that is effective. Incentives can then help drive the right behaviours and incentives can be shifted around if you start to see you know, certain behaviour, uh, like harsh braking or something, uh, becomes more of a problem than something else, then you might want to focus incentives there. So incentives are part of the tool, but an overall package that develops the clear policy guidance and uh, safety cultures is probably more important. Okay. And finally, just quickly then, um, do you have any recommendations for the kinds of technologies that fleet managers could be looking for that might help them monitor driver attention? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question and um, there are, you know, a, a number of systems and technologies out there that are beginning to uh, look at monitoring driver distraction and fatigue, monitoring technologies and, and driver state. Uh, some are more developed than others, and uh, but it's, it's fair to say, you know, we'll just complete a review, the on safety executive one, and uh, there's, there's little published evidence of which which ones are effective and uh, versus others. So it, it's actually quite a challenging marketplace for fleets. I've got uh, great sympathy. Um, and, and often we've had to do testing uh, for, for organisations of different technologies they're interested in 
to independently assess which ones are suitable for their fleet. Um, so it's, it, it is a, a difficult market, to be honest. And by 2024, you know, EU regulations will require all new vehicles to have advanced distraction recognition systems in them. And they are, what they will do is alert when the driver is visually distracted. So it will have some you know, monitoring eyes off road time. Um, and so that will have a, a big change in the, the adoption of these technologies. But it is also something that um, you know, fleets could be looking at now as part of their onboard safety management systems. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, that concludes the Q&A session of today's webinar. A huge thank you again to our speaker, Dr. Neil Kinnear, and of course our sponsors at Reflex Vehicle Hire. We do hope you found today's content informative and you've taken home some useful lessons that you could use to help work towards our shared goal of safe and healthy mobility in fleets. If you'd like to continue the discussions uh, that we've had in today's webinar, uh, We've got our Global Fleet Champions LinkedIn page, which you should be able to join in on after this. Um, our upcoming webinars coming up next uh, is a spotlight on using technology to manage road risk on June 23rd, a spotlight on driver fatigue on July 2nd, and essential checks to work related uh, to manage work related road risk on 14th of July. I do hope you hope you found today's content useful, and hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.